Hello, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Yuko Itatsu. I'm a professor at the University of Tokyo at the Interfaculty Initiative in Information Studies and the Associate Director of the BAI Global Forum at the University. I'd like to welcome you all to the, our third and last installment of a three-part series on artificial intelligence and social justice. As we begin our event, I'd like to invite Professor Kaori Hayashi to give the opening remarks. Professor Hayashi is the director of the BAI Global Forum, as well as executive vice president of the University of Tokyo. Professor Hayashi, I'll pass the mic on to you. Thank you very much, Professor Itatsu, and welcome to our global, uh, BAI Global Forum workshop. Um, my name is Kaori Hayashi, and I serve as the director of BAI Global Forum, as well as executive vice president of the University of Tokyo, in charge of diversity and global. And let me explain a little bit about BAI Global Forum. Uh, some of you may have heard about it for the three, for the third time, but please bear with me because some of you are uh, uh, here for the first time. So BAI Global Forum is a place where a group of researchers and practitioners gather to think about the meaning of information technology from the perspective of gender and minority issues. We are interested in understanding various kinds of B related to AI, such as behind AI, beneath AI, and before AI. In short, we are committed to investigating the social meaning of AI critically to contribute to a better and more equitable society in this age of AI. We began last year in August of 2020, so we are a baby in the field. But like infants, we are absorbing lots of information and trying to process them. It is particularly important for us to learn from like-minded scholars outside the university and outside Japan, as one of our main goals is to create a global network of scholars on this topic. We are also eager to establish dialogues with those working outside of the university settings, including lawyers, journalists, government and NGO officials, as well as professionals from private industries. I extend my heartfelt welcome to everyone joining us today, and I hope this opportunity will become the, one of the good opportunity to make this, this such a network. And it is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Ivana Bartoletti today. Ms. Bartoletti is a renowned thought leader in the field of responsible technology. And I am particularly excited to have her because Ms. Bartoletti has been arguing for the significance of diversity within technology. As we all know, the field of information technology, including AI, has been dominated by a very small segment of the population all over the world. In the case of Japan, including this university, it consists almost entirely of elite Japanese men. The shocking level of absence of diversity has been the cause of some well-known social controversies here, and many other issues remain under-recognized or entirely ignored. So I believe it is critically important to assess the meaning of data and AI from the perspective of power so that we may appreciate the need for more diversity in the field. And I know today's lecture and subsequent discussion will be a wonderful platform for discussing some of the most complex and challenging topics of today's world. And that is exactly why we established BAI Global Forum I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Yuko Itatsu, for setting up this exciting opportunity, and I hope you will enjoy your time here. And finally, I thank and welcome Ms. Bartoletti once again for joining us today to inspire us. Thank you very much. Now, Yuko, it's your turn. Thank you, Kaori, for your opening remarks. Uh, we're 
very, very happy to be welcoming Ivana Bartoletti today to speak about the issues surrounding AI ethics as we think about fair and equitable ways to implement them in society. She's been very vocal about how we must be cautious about the use of AI as it can easily become yet another mechanism for control or oppression. Today, we'll hear from Ms. Bartoletti about the various challenges we need to face to ensure technology benefits everyone. Ivana Bartoletti is co-founder of the Women Leading in AI Network. She's also a visiting policy fellow at the Oxford University Internet Institute, as, as well as technical director of privacy and digital ethics at Deloitte. She is the author of An Artificial Revolution on Power, Politics, and AI, which was published in 2019 by Indigo Press and has received wide acclaim. She's also received recognition for her work by being named Woman of the Year at the Cybersecurity Awards in 2019. Her talk today is entitled Power, Politics, and AI, Building a Better Future. We've asked Ms. Bartoletti to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll continue on to a Q&A session. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest speaker, Ivana Bartoletti. Ivana, if you're ready, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure um, to be with you today. Um, thank you so much for organizing this, but in particular, thank you so much for your leadership in this, this, in this debate. Um, we absolutely need to work globally um, on something which is so transformative and so powerful, and in particular, when it comes to women and um, gender and women leadership in this debate, we really need to increase our global cooperation and to make sure that we tackle the risks, but we also harness the potential of this technology. But we can only do so at a global level because there is nothing that is related to, to geopolitics more than artificial intelligence. And I'll come to that in a minute. I wanted to start, can you all see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet, let me just do it straight away. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to start with this. With this. So um, I just wanted to quickly say what I am working on and why I have started what I'm doing with the global network, Women Leading Artificial Intelligence, with the book that you mentioned, and with my work at Oxford University. So a few years ago, um, I have a background in privacy, and I will talk about privacy because there is very much of a connection to what I'm being, I'll be discussing with you today, but also because I think um, we need a, to rethink the concept of privacy on a global scale, and we need a gender perspective to it. But I will come to this because it's something that is very dear to, to my heart. So I started working on, on all these issues a few years back um, when I was really working on, on privacy legislation across the globe, when I was really um, helping organizations from uh, keeping their data safe. And that has been you know, my passion, my commitment for decades. But then I started to look at uh, what many people have called this as, as data surveillance. And, and, um, and I started to look at how uh, so much data was collected about all of us. And I started to really look at this data and I started to look at this mantra that we've seen all around the world around the importance of data, the process of datification, the idea that data is so neutral and so um, objective and therefore all our policies, all our decisions, they need to be based on data that is out there. And I really started to look into that um, with colleagues from around the world, amazing women trailblazer is in this debate, like Joy Bull and Will in the US. And I started to look into all these issues around data. But then what happened 
is that over the last few years, we have seen some really, truly amazing things happening with technology. We have seen precision medicine. We have seen the ability of artificial intelligence, machine learning to spot diseases way before they manifest. We have seen um, artificial intelligence used in education to support and assist children with learning disability by really understand and um, uh, how to support them better. So we've seen loads of, of really interesting things happening with technology. But we've also seen some really pretty scary things happening with technology. We have seen stories emerging from all across the globe around how artificial intelligence systems, particularly when used for decision making, were discriminating against women, in particular women of colour, but discriminating the most vulnerable across the world. And this is where I always say that over the last decade, and in particular over the last couple of years, the issue of data has become a political issue. And this is true particularly for women. This is over the last few years in particular, this is where the politics of data and the politics of data classification have become mainstream. And this is why we are here having this conversation. We have seen cases, and I would say horror cases, of systems paying women less than we, that, that, um, giving less credit to women than to men. This is, for example, the story that happened with the Apple Golden Sachs credit card. We have seen the um, surveillance systems um, and related to fraud in the Dutch. Um, in, in, in uh, which the Dutch court identified as, as um, perpetuating um, stereotypes and uh, uh, sorry, perpetuating um, existing inequalities. We have seen recently cases around delivery companies that were using algorithms that were discriminatory. And these algorithms were discriminatory because they were not allowing people to cancel a shift at the very last minute um, because um, they were penalizing um, drivers who were canceling shifts at the very last minute, not recognizing that the reason why somebody may cancel a shift at the very last minute is because they have to attend a strike or because they have to attend a sick child. But we have seen stories like Compass, the software in the US that um, regardless of the crime committed, would automatically, automatically assign a higher reoffending risks to people of colour than to white people. And we have seen adverts for pay, for jobs that were promoting jobs that pay more to men and jobs that pay less to women. Last year, in the country where I am in right now, the United Kingdom, what happened is that students could not go to take their A-levels, which is the final exams before going to university, into a classroom. So an algorithm this was used to assess the students. And what happened was that automatically, the algorithm was given a higher grade to students coming from private education and students coming from state education. And what happened in the United Kingdom last year was the students took on the streets to say they didn't want to be graded by an algorithm and having a demonstration against the algorithm. Now, before we move any further, I just wanted to say to you that um, the algorithm is not discriminatory. The machine does not discriminate. What discriminates 
are the humans that designed their systems, are the humans that did not pay enough attention to the potential consequences of the system. I was very um, alarmed when students in the UK were demonstrating against the algorithm, because the issue is who is behind these machines? They're not some magical tools. They are created by humans that deploy them. And if the humans are biased, if the humans um, have stereotypes and prejudices, that we should not be surprised that the algorithms reflect the prejudice or the bias and the humans. So this is the first really important point that I wanted to make. So these issues have become very much into the spotlight. These issues have become very much public, very much mainstream, and the issues that these systems are not neutral, but reflect the bias, the stereotypes of the humans is now public knowledge. Now, what has become public knowledge and what we really need to be careful of is machines automating, hardwiring, coding, existing inequalities, existing stereotypes, existing racism, existing sexism into machines that make decisions, predict and edit the world as we see it. And now I want, having shown you these cases, I want us to step back for a moment. And I want us to think about why all this has happened. This is where I'm going to go back to privacy. When the digital was created decades ago, when the web was created, it was created with a promise of freedom, with a promise of connected, connecting us all across the world, with a, pro, with a promise of emancipation, and that promise of liberty, of freedom, is still out there in the many people who are um, in the many people who are um, there to um, in entrepreneurs or, or people like me who are there to um, really um, create and put new um, technology and new in, 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 the, in the systems. However, what we've seen happening over the last decade is that an unchecked unsupervised um, web and digital with little controls. If you only think about how long it's taken in Europe, for example, to have in place the general data protection regulation for us and, and to Japan has, has, has got an adequacy decision, which is great. It means that we can trade, but how long has it taken around the world to get to the point where we are now, where we are finally enhancing privacy regulations across the globe. And 180 countries have laws around AI and sorry, around privacy right now. But for too long, the web and the digital have let, uh, have grown in an unchecked and fettered way. And what we have seen over the last decades is that we have seen um, the trends of the digital have been the trends of datification, which means that we are collecting data everywhere and at every single point of, of our daily life, whether it's when we pay, when it's when we use the public transport, when it's when we use the internet. Um, and the process of datification and the process of surveillance, those are the two main trends that we have seen happening over the last decades with the digital. And this is leading to consequences that I've outlined here in this slide, which are really important to then understand 
why all this matters and why algorithms and decision making in particular are a risk and in particular to women. The first is that there is a lot of there are a lot of privacy threats that are new, and that means that data is accumulated, um, and the um, we are witnessing a real asymmetry of power between the large companies that collect a lot of information about us as us as individuals. Um, but we also, this, this power, this asymmetry of power is probably the most important characteristic of the web right now. And in this asymmetry of power is an issue of privacy, but it's also an issue around antitrust. And this is why what we're seeing across the world from, from um, Asia to, to, to the US is a larger and stronger action on anti trust um, and competition between um, in, in, in the digital ecosystem. What we also see is that every single data piece of information becomes um, either financial information, so for example, um, information that are um, related to the to you know to our browsing activities, what we like and what we don't like, a lot of this information, which are um, which are um, relevant to, to to what we do in our daily life, they become they get ingested into algorithms, fed into machines that make predictions, assumptions about us as human beings. This is a problem that is often called the problem of inferential data. So by ingesting a lot of information, a lot of data into a system, a machine, then we can make predictions around what you will do or like, will like, could like. And this is potentially quite dangerous because it has an impact on the autonomy that we have as individuals. The other issue that we are facing is that the way that the internet and the web have grown, they challenge legislation as it is now. And this is problematic. And, the, um, and of course, it challenges the way that we are um, regulating the, this, this, uh, the asset, which is data. And I want to spend one minute to really talk to you about this asset of data. Um, often data is called the new oil. And that is something that I challenge because data is not the new oil. Oil is a tangible asset. Data is not tangible. And the issue with saying that data is the new oil is that with oil, once you've used it, you've used it, it's finished. With data, that's not the case. You can use it, you use it again and over and over again. It's very much of an intangible asset, which makes it so difficult to regulate globally. But now I want to say, why did I talk to you about, um, about um, the problem, the, the issue of data? The reason why I wanted to talk about data is because data is ingested into AI, into these machines that we create. And I want to name the issue that is the closest to my heart and the issue around which I've written my book, An Artificial Revolution, and the issue around which I really want to have a discussion with you and globally. For years and decades, as I said, we have built on the trends of datification. We have challenged the concept of privacy as we've known it, but also by doing so, building on these trends, the, we've given data 
the role of objectivity, of something that can drive us into better policy and better decision making. But I wanted to challenge this straight away. There is nothing neutral about data, as there is nothing neutral in technology. Data is just a picture of society as it is right now. It's just a photo. It shows society as it is with centuries of inequality, sexes, races, discrimination. If we take the data of how its society is right now, and we feed this data into the systems, we're doing nothing but hardwiring and coding the existing society into decisions around the future. And this is extremely problematic, and in particularly, particularly it's problematic for women. Now, when I started, I show you the first slide that I showed you was a slide around the stories that we've seen dominating in the media around discrimination caused by AI. And I said to you, it's not the AI, it's the humans that discriminate. The problem is that something like artificial intelligence or machine learning, what they do is discriminating because this is what machine learning is. Machine learning is all about discriminating. It's all about putting things into groups, identifying trends and make prediction. But if the data that we are continuously collecting as the data was something um, sacred, if the data was something as absolutely objective and unchallengeable, if the data that we're collecting everywhere, if we're feeding this data into these machines, making decisions around which ads we see, whether we can have access to a loan or not, what kind of education we should receive, whether we go to prison or not, whether we're guilty or innocent, where the money should be, should be spent, who is going to be a risk of the fault in a payment. If algorithms increasingly have a function which is allocative, editorial, predictive, then all the bias that we as humans have, which is perpetuated into the data, if all this goes into these machines and make decisions, then we're just automating society as it is now. And this is why this slide has a picture of what I think are the risks and the challenges around automation of decisions in particular. And it really focuses a lot on, on decision-making in here. So there are individual and collective harms. And it's really important to understand what they look like. So we have looked at the discrimination that could have a loss of opportunity and economic loss. Um, we've looked at the editorial function of algorithms where, for example, on social media, where you have um, things like cluster and filter bubbles, which means that we keep the similar together. And by doing so, we create eco chambers. And by doing so, we do not do anything but amplify what is already out there. May I say that is, this also has a huge impact on democracy. Because if machine learning is used to decide what we listen to, which news we are served, that means that you and I would have different news with a serious risk to democracy if the common knowledge, if the common news, the things that we see, 
are not shared. And we are seeing the consequences of this happening already. And in my book, I make a clear, strong link between filter bubbles, machine learning, and the rise of populism, which is um, around the world, which has one trait in common, which is to hate women. I, these are the harms that we're facing. And it's really important that we understand that along with fantastic opportunities, we really have to make sure that we understand what the risks are. <clears throat> and once again, I want to reiterate that with algorithms increasingly having a, an allocative function, which is to allocate resources, which in algorithms increasingly having a editorial function, which means algorithms that um, have an editorial function, which means that they decide which adverts you are exposed to. With algorithms increasing having a predictive function, which means to predict, for example, who may be a risk in the future, who may be default in a payment, or which young people, or which family may be a risk of ending up into crime or poverty. I wanna focus for a moment on predictive technologies. And I wanna say something that sometimes is a bit controversial, but something that I strongly believe in. Um, predictive technologies are very scary in my view, because when it comes to predictive technologies, to me, what we're talking about is a self-fulfilling prophecies. To an extent, life is and should be around meeting people, dreams, encounters, change of possibilities because of what you do and the random circumstances in your life that lead you to meet people, ideas, and love. Predictive technologies, in my view, are dangerous because they, by using existing data, as we said, to make a prediction around the future, they end up wrapping surveillance and control around those who are already vulnerable in our society. And I want to explain this. If you want to predict who is going to default to payment based on existing data, you'll be looking at a variety of factors. For example, income. But income is not neutral because some people earn less because of historic reasons, like women, or some people of a certain race. And if you think that these people are going to default payment, you're gonna predict that they will do because of how not neutral data is. You're going to wrap control around them. And by doing so, you're going to already um, wrap the surveillance and, and navigate and make your choices based on that and navigate these people towards a certain direction, which is not defaulting from the past. To me, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. For me, this is around coding the past into the future. For me, this is about not allowing what is the core of our life which is move away from patterns. And machine learning is all about patterns and making policy decisions based on existing data, allocating, for example, policy resources based on existing data used to make predictions, to me is the opposite of what life should be all about, which is escaping from the pattern and finding new avenues. 
predictive technologies are something that we and should be looking into, and women in particular, because how much stereotypes, control, we have wrapped around our freedoms, our bodies, and our dreams. And there is a very strong gender approach to predictive technologies that we absolutely need globally to look into. I want to conclude on two more topics. The first one is I really want to um, have a conversation around how we, um, I'm just going to find the right slide on this. Yes, this. So I wanted to conclude on two elements. The first one is I wanted to conclude on an overview on the controls that need to be put around algorithms. The reason why I'm showing you this is that I don't want you to, to look into the details, but I wanted to show you the breadth of um, controls and, and that organizations would need to establish around the use of algorithms. And then I want to conclude on three main points around privacy, AI and ethics from a gender perspective that to me are absolutely important to rethink at a global level. So the first point is this in this slide. As we said, we've got to challenge the sanctity of the concept of data. Data is not neutral. Data reflects society as it is now. Data mirrors the reality and centuries of inequality, bias, um, and discrimination. By ingesting data as it is now into the systems, we do not, we simply replicate, amplify, and perpetuate what we have in society at this particular moment. The reason why bias creeps into the systems is because of the data, is because the data is not checked, is because the data is not manipulated to achieve the objective that you want, so the positive, rather than discriminating the present, using present, the present. But data, but bias and discrimination is not just a matter of data. It's also a matter of, um, of for example, things like proxy. Um, so, for example, dates, things like a, a postcode, things like a, um, or a, a particular feature in a system can act as a proxy for something else. And I always give an example that I find is extreme, but I think it shows the complexity of the matter and why all the systems that I've, see, I've put in that list is what organizations need to do. And the reason why I put all of this is to show you the complexity of what needs to be done. And the fact that if it's left to the companies to do this, or public sector or private sector voluntarily, then it's risky. And this is why I think it's really important that we advocate for global norms and regulation that needs to force organizations to ensure that there are the adequate controls and tools around these systems. I'll give you an example. If I am an organization and I am based in, in, in a city center of um, a large city. And I'm using an automated software to recruit a member of my staff. And in this automated software, I'm, uh, I choose some features. So for example, one of my features is that I want the employee to come to work on time. So if my work starts at seven, I want the employee to come at seven. So I'm looking out of all the employees that I currently have, who are the ones that come at seven? And I look for similar characteristics using machine learning. 
Now, the problem with that is that who is more likely to come to work early in the, mo in the morning if my um, office is right in the city center of the most expensive city in the world? Is it the young male professional who lives nearby and can afford a, city, a, a, a flat in the city? Or is it the young mum with two kids, maybe single, who has to drop the kids off to school in the morning? The reason why I'm saying this is because it's not just a matter of data. It's also a matter of who chooses, who designs the algorithm, the machine, the AI system. These systems are not neutral. And this is why diversity is so important. If we do not have enough women in that room to design the system, to decide which features we're going to use, we're not going to have the attention to understand what the harm for women would be. If we don't have somebody that says, hey, by doing so, you're going to discriminate, then this is going to be problematic. All the controls that I put in place in there, these are the ones that most of us would use when we design the systems and that I would introduce when I work with organizations. This is a huge list. It's a choice. Being fair with algorithms is a choice that organizations need to make. And this is why with the women leading in AI, a global level, we're strongly advocating for these controls to be mandatory for organizations. So that organizations before releasing a system, they have to ensure that that particular system is fair with all the complexity that means. And we can discuss that in the Q&A. The last thing that I wanted to say is that, and I wanted to close on this, is that is around privacy. And the reason why I mentioned privacy is because there is nothing around neutral about technology, nothing about neutral about data. And one thing that to me is very important is that how we rethink the concept of privacy at a global level and how do we bring together different cultures across the globe to rethink privacy. I'm talking from a gender perspective here. Privacy as an individual right, as we often see this in the West, I do not think that works in the era and the age of AI and algorithmic decision-making. I would like to see whether we can globally rethink the concept of privacy from a gender-based approach, which is around privacy as a collective value, which is around privacy, not just as consent, because consent, as women know very well, doesn't take into account the interdependencies, the relations that people have when they make their choices. And in the age of AI, where the data is used and to surveil, to predict, then I think it's really important that we rethink the concept of privacy as a collective value and I do think that agenda discussions around this is absolutely crucial. And I've just finished a chapter for a global book on digital policy from a feminist perspective. And we have contributions from all across the globe. And in that piece, I argue very firmly that we need to rethink the concept of privacy with gender lenses across the globe moving away from the individual rights approach, which is characteristic in the West, 
and rethinking it together on what it means from a standpoint of autonomy and freedom that is very important for women's lives and bodies. The last thing I wanted to mention in all this is that it's absolutely important that we understand that nothing about data, nothing about te technology, nothing about algorithms is neutral, but it's the product of history, is the product of who is dominant. And as we said earlier, if there's only men making decisions around which data go into a system, which features are used into an AI systems, then we cannot and must not be surprised if the system is biased. So diversity, diversity, diversity. But I want one thing that I would like to say is that diversity in the coding room is not the only thing that we need. Because there is something bigger than an algorithm. And this is around deciding what technology is for in the first place. We can have the most perfect algorithm, which is not biased, does not discriminate, but yet we can use that algorithm for the very wrong thing. This is because what we need to do, I believe, at global level, and particularly with a gendered approach, is to understand what technology is in the first place and understand that even if something is technologically possible, does not mean that we have to do it. And who is going to make the decisions around which technology products to build and use? I do strongly believe that we need more women in power at any level to make those decisions so we do not leave it to either the, just the big tech companies or the men in charge, but we have a much more important discussions around how we want technology to reshape our lives, to reshape the labor market, to shape the future moving forward. This is why in my view, AI is far more than data. It's far more than technology. It's really about power. And when it comes to power, then again, that is very important that that power is distributed and that we do not leave a huge part of the population without owning it. And this is the purpose of my work, the purpose of the women leading in AI. And I think, I hope it's something that you all can join me to advocate for moving forward. Thank you so much, Ivana. That was wonderful. Um, I think uh, a lot of thought-provoking ideas, especially at the end towards um, even the idea of a refusal of AI in certain areas. I think that's a really interesting topic that we need to talk about as well. Can you all help me give a, a very big warm thank you to Ivana Bartoletti for sharing her work and all these very fundamental questions that I, I think we could probably spend hours and hours on and just keep um, continuing to talk about. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for you to, to have, for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. This concludes our summer series on AI and social justice. Um, thank you once again for joining us today. Uh, please do remain stay safe and uh, goodbye. <laughs>